Hi, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Cecilia Cancelero, and I am the senior editor for U.S. and Latin American history at Cambridge University Press. I'm very pleased to welcome you today, where I will be in conversation with Elena Abbott and Karen Cook Bell. We'll talk about the work they've done on slavery, resistance, and black freedom more generally, and you'll get to hear about their books, uh, which I have right behind me, um, Beacons of Liberty and Running from Bondage, both published this past year and both getting much praise since then. I am really delighted to be able to introduce you to these two women. It's been my pleasure and privilege working with them toward the publication of these two very important books. Elena Abbott is an author, editor, and historian whose scholarship focuses on slavery and anti-slavery in the Atlantic wor world. She was awarded the Harold N. Glassman Distinguished Dissertation Award from Georgetown University, where she received her PhD. Her book, Beacons of Liberty, International Free Soil and the Fight for Racial Justice in Antebellum America, which we'll be talking about today, has been called a terrific book that deepens our understanding of transnational abolitionism and a first-rate study of international freedom struggles in the 19th century. Elena is currently working on a young adult version of this book uh, to bring the history of free soil migration to life for younger readers. Karen Cook-Bell is Associate Professor of History and Chair of the History and Government Department at Bowie State University. Her research, writing, and teach teaching focus on slavery and the slave trade, the Civil War and Reconstruction, and women's history. She's the author of two books, Claiming Freedom, Race, Kinship, and Land in 19th Century Georgia, which was published in 2018 and won the Georgia Board of Regents Excellence in Research Award, and Running from Bondage, Enslaved Women and Their Remarkable Fight for Freedom in Revolutionary America. Uh, this book, Running from Bondage, has been called pathbreaking and beautifully written, and one reviewer stated that after Running from Bondage, no account of this period will be complete unless it shows how Black women's freedom seeking brought about revolutionary change. Karen's currently editing a collection of essays on Southern Black women and their struggle for freedom during the Civil War and Reconstruction. And I'm very happy to say that we will be publishing that book at Cambridge in 2023. So now we will move on to hear from each author and we will start with Karen Cook-Bell. Thank you, Cecilia, for that wonderful introduction. So Running From Bondage tells the story of enslaved women who escaped or who attempted to escape slavery during the revolutionary era, a time period when chaos of war and lack of oversight made the escape of black women possible in both the North and South. In fact, one third of fugitives were enslaved women according to historian Gary Nash. So my book consists of five chapters that explains why and how enslaved women escaped slavery and the challenging circumstances they faced over the course of five decades from the 1770s to the 1810s. And what, bring these chap what brings these chapters together is how Black women are thinking about and acting on their desire for freedom. So I first unpack enslaved women's labor during the colonial period and their various resistance strategies, and then take a deep dive into looking at the escape of individual women. And what my book really underscores is the fact that enslaved women were not one dimensional figures, but lived multi-dimensional lives as wives, mothers, sisters, and freedom fighters. And I began this study several years ago and the research for this study brought me to the realization that there is so much more that historians can uncover in the lives of enslaved women. Although the evidence is fragmented, the experiences of fugitive women are far from unknowable. I examined over 1,000 runaway slave advertisements, as well as trial records of fugitive slaves, and an account of George Washington's escaped slave on a judge. And what I make clear in my book is that instead of putting Black women at the margins of the American Revolution and abolitionism, it is important to see them as they protested with their feet by running away, which underscores the vital role of Black women in seeking to move the nation forward toward a more perfect union. So of course, uh, fugitivity is the central theme of running from bondage. 
And based on historian Marissa Fuente's definition, fugitivity refers to the experience of enslaved women as fugitives, both hidden from view and in the state of fleeing. It also signifies the fragile condition of runaways who came into visibility through runaway slave advertisements. I argue that motherhood, freedom, and love of family often served as a catalyst for attempted escape during the American Revolution. Time and time again in the advertisements that I examine, Black women are fleeing with their child or children. In fact, enslaved women had as much incentive to run away as did men, and perhaps even more since they were abused physically, sexually, and psychologically. So the historiography of slave resistance has emphasized viewing slave flight on the same continuum as rebellion and revolt. I take the same approach in my study and demonstrate that women and girls in bondage were not content and running away or flight was one of the ways in which they registered their protest. Slaveholders lived with this inescapable reality on a consistent basis and they did everything in their power to have their property returned. Posting newspaper advertisements in newspapers was the most pervasive method used to secure the return of runaway women and girls. And newspaper advertisements, of course, lean heavily toward the physical, offering detailed information about names and ethnic origins, where they may have gone, and rewards for their return. The advertisements also reflected on the ground collective transformations of names, ethnic changes, and identities. In other words, the fugitive body became a living and moving text of victimization, protest, and personhood, as Douglas Brent Chambers has stated. So the underlying causes of women's flight were efforts to protect their bodies and womanhood against the violence and exploitation that was an everyday feature of their lived experience, as well as to protect their children from the harmful effects of slavery. The average age of a self-emancipated woman was 22, and women between the ages of 18 and 25 predominate in the advertisements. Girls as young as 13 escape independently, and women as old as 62 escape with their daughters and families. And what was surprising is that women also ran away pregnant. So running from bondage is a compelling story of the ways in which enslaved women fought for their liberation and that of their families during the revolutionary era. And I'll let Helena take it away at this point. Well, thank you. And Cecilia, thank you for the lovely introduction. Thank you to Cambridge University Press for hosting this great conversation. I'm excited about what we're gonna be talking about here. So Beacons of Liberty is about how the expansion of freedom beyond the borders of the United States influenced the fight for freedom in the United States. It's about how free African-Americans, fugitive slaves, and white observers crossed international borders in search of black freedom and equality. And it's ultimately about how their experiences abroad helped them shape and form ideas about freedom, citizenship, and national character in the United States. So beginning in the late 18th century and continuing through the 19th century, Diverse anti-slavery efforts began reshaping the map of slavery and freedom in the Atlantic world. Anti-slave trade legislation and emancipation laws either immediately or gradually began freeing enslaved populations in places like Haiti, Canada, Mexico, some newly independent South American nations, um, Great Britain and the British West Indies, Sierra Leone and Liberia, these places became international free soil havens, which is a phrase I use that builds on Atlantic world scholarship on the principle of free soil to identify places with the potential to free and protect self-emancipated men and women and offer equal standing for free African-American emigrants. What my book shows is that the influence of these places on the fight for freedom in the United States was absolutely profound, but incredibly complex. So over the course of the book, I tackle what I see as the three main effects that international free soil had on the fight for freedom and racial justice in the 19th century. First is that it provided physical alternatives to slavery and racism in the United States. In other words, places where free or fugitive people could go to escape slavery or to build new lives with greater access to things like education and economic opportunity. 
Second, international free soil provided conceptual alternatives to slavery and racism in the United States. What I mean by this is that these places showed that freedom could be done, that emancipation could be safely and effectively enacted, and that indeed black people could thrive in freedom. And finally, individual free soil havens became powerful symbols of, um, of freedom that stood in stark contract to the ongoing existence of slavery in the United States. So very importantly in my book, these different free soil spaces had very different forms of government. They had various approaches to emancipation and differing levels of anti-slavery sentiment. And they also had different degrees of geopolitical power with which to police and enforce the anti-slavery borders that they established against the encroachment of American pro-slavery interests and slave catchers. But also very importantly, they all had their internal economic, political and social currents that shaped and changed them over time in the exact same way that of course the United States had internal economic, political and social currents that changed it over time. So there was never a single static thing that international free soil looked like or did. But even as these internal dynamics shifted over time and thus the geopolitics of slavery and freedom shifted over time, a big part of the significance of international free soil havens within the American anti-slavery movement was how they were seen. Over time, they developed specific and distinct reputations among three groups of people that I focus on in the book. The first is self-liberated men and women or fugitive slaves who took the enormous risk of running away. The second is the thousands of free men and women who made the difficult decision to emigrate abroad in search for something more commensurate with their vision of freedom. And the third is the broad spectrum of white anti-slavery advocates, some of whom were abolitionist radicals and some of whom believed that while slavery was a moral evil, there was no room for black people in the United States. So very conservative anti-slavery thinkers. And then of course, individual free soil havens also developed specific and distinct reputations among enslavers who felt threatened and increasingly encircled by the expansion of anti-slavery borders um, on, in every direction from the United States. So over the course of the book, I track very specifically what these different free soil spaces meant to these different groups and why. In the process, um, what I show is that they had a profound collective impact on the American anti-slavery movement and the increasing radicalization of American politics around the issue of slavery. One of the big arguments I make is that international free soil havens helped Americans of all colors legal standing and ideological persuasions develop and articulate um, specific ideas about who belonged in the United States and under what conditions, what freedom should look like and how it should be enacted, and what formerly enslaved people needed in order to be successful in a white majority nation structured on white supremacy. So that's all I'll say for now because we have a wonderful discussion ahead of us. Um, and we'll be talking about archive stories, but I'll leave it at there. Those are the broad strokes of the book. And thanks for joining us today, everyone out there. Thank you so much. Thank you both. So for me, working on these two books at the same time as they were published at similar times was just incredible because they complement one another in such um, interesting ways. And so having you both in conversation today is a real treat for me. Um, and I just want to let the attendees know um, also that if you joined us late, we're taking questions throughout in the Q&A box. So put your questions in there and I will get to as many as I can um, within the hour. Um, so I want to ask you, you both some questions, obviously. Um, so both of your books expand on the study of slavery and resistance in important and in new ways. Um, Elena, you expand beyond the familiar history of the Underground Railroad to illustrate how this struggle for equality and freedom for enslaved people in the US also unfolded outside of this country's borders, which I, I find just fascinating. Um, and Karen, your work fills a significant void 
uh, in the study of Black women's resistance to slavery by showing the ways that Black women resisted bondage and did so during the American Revolutionary period, which is a period that is often overlooked in this context. So I wanna ask both of you, um, we can start with Karen and then move to Elena. Um, what led you to this research? And then what motivated you once you were in the middle of this research to write the books that you each wrote? Thank you, thank you, um, Cecilia. So researching my first book, Claiming Freedom, introduced me to women who fled slavery either alone or with their family members during the late 18th century. This led me to question how widespread was the flight of enslaved women. And my research led me to the American Revolution, which according to historian Benjamin Quarles, was the first large scale slave rebellion in American history. So I wanted to tell the stories of these women who fled or who attempted to flee slavery during the revolutionary era. I also believed it was important to take a deep dive into examining the lived experiences of the women who fled and to think deeply about how they sought to reimagine their world and create new spaces for themselves during a very violent era. I asked myself what other knowledge of resistance can be used to complicate the agency of these women. And certainly when we study the geography of black spaces, we need to leave open the possibility of a lot of different things. I thought of Rebecca Scott's term, geography in motion, and how I could create an analytical space for examining fugitive women's mobility during this era. And of course, newspaper advertisements really map fugitive women's geography, detail individual stories, and go to the very reason for attempted escape. So I was excited to examine these colonial newspaper advertisements because they provide a window into the world of fugitive women. And certainly newspaper advertisements by no means reflect the totality of slave flight as newspaper files are often incomplete and enslavers tended to place ads only when fugitives were missing for many days or even months. Also newspapers were published in a few urban centers of the period so that plantations or homes near such centers were the main sources of inf information uh, or advertisements. So there are limits to the advertisements and understanding the lives of enslaved women since we do not know the ultimate fate of the majority of the individuals named in the advertisements. So that is why I pursued this study and it's been a very fruitful endeavor. And you know, I've I've always been interested in the question of where freedom feels more free and why. Um, my, my initial interest in this set of questions stems back um, almost 15 years ago now to when I first read about the Creole mutiny or the Creole uprising in 1840, 1841, um, which is actually the story that opens Beacons of Liberty. So that, um, that longstanding interest has really stayed with me. And in that story, the 135 enslaved men and women aboard the domestic slave trade vessel, the Brig Creole, um, they rose up against their enslavers and took control of the ship. Uh, they were en route from Virginia to New Orleans, um, to the slave market in New Orleans. But they knew that if they sailed the ship that they had commandeered for the Bahamas, which was British territory, they would be freed because of the British Emancipation Act of 1834. But the thing that really caught my attention was that once there and once, once they were indeed freed um, by the British, a significant number of them actually immediately left from the Bahamas right there from the harbor of Nassau to Jamaica, which was another British island. So when I first read the story, I immediately started wondering why Jamaica would feel like the better choice for people who had just enacted their, their liberation in the Bahamas. What was going on there? Why choose one place over another? Um, what did they expect to find? And, and why did they even have a specific set of expectations? So this mode of questioning um, continued and has continued to guide much of my research interests um, throughout the past 15 years. I've always searched for stories of people who crossed borders to find freedom or a place that felt more free to them 
over time and in various different geographical contexts. And eventually, um, that's what led me to focus this book on the people traveling across international borders to escape the United States. So most famously, this includes the Underground Railroad to Canada. But as I traced down different pathways in the archives, I began focusing more and more on the sizable number of people crossing borders to Mexico, to the Caribbean, and across the Atlantic to England and West Africa. And I wanted to know why. I was especially interested when it came to free African-American migrants, I wanted to know why they were choosing one place over another. Um, and I wanted to know why Canada had become such a major symbol of freedom, both in the American anti-slavery movement of the 19th century, but also still in the US cultural memory about, about freedom and um, escape, especially because there were so many people going to other places. So I also wanted to know what was important to them. What were they hoping to find and what did they find? So I think in, in short, um, I have always been interested in essentially the what I would call the ways and the whys of um, what led people across international borders away from the United States in search of freedom, especially when it was happening in greater and greater numbers at the very same time that the fight for freedom in the United States was picking up steam and becoming such a flashpoint in American political and social life. So that's, that's my answer. I have really just stuck to those questions for a long time now, and I think I'll stay with them for a while yet. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. So, you know, both of your books make for a very powerful reading for a number of reasons. Um, and I think um, one of the, the reasons is um, that you both do an incredible job of bringing the lives and stories of real people to our attention, um, acknowledging and sharing the human face of this history that you're writing about. Um, so I wonder if you both could each share a story or two um, from your books that was particularly inspiring to you during your research and your writing. Karen, do you want to start? Sorry. Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So um, the part Grant was inspiring. All of the stories of these women escaping slavery are inspiring. But Margaret um, escaped slavery twice, first in 1770 and then again in 1773, both times from Baltimore, Maryland. And in her first escape, she wore men's clothing and sought to conceal her identity by serving as a waiting boy to an escaped English convict servant named John Chambers. So Margaret sought to escape by passing as both white and male, performing fugitivity in a way that another escaped slave Ellen Craft would do decades later. And Margaret was a historical outlier. She was literate, she was a mulatto, she had experienced slavery on three Caribbean islands, and she escaped twice, both times from Baltimore. So through a close reading of the ads, we know a great deal about her life up to the time of her escape. And the use of her surname by Margaret reflects the acculturation and anglicization process. And we don't know the circumstances surrounding how she became or how she came to use the surname, but the use of her surname indicates that she sought to portray a sense of dignity and freedom. Another um, woman who is inspiring is Jenny. And Jenny escaped slavery um, in Virginia in 1776. And she escaped with her two-year-old daughter, daughter, Winnie. And she escaped while she was pregnant. And in the advertisement, it says big with child. So um, she escaped and she was on the run for seven months when her enslaver placed a second advertisement for her escape. Um, she, she, of course, um, was seeking to reach Richmond, Virginia. She escaped from Petersburg, Virginia. And Richmond, Virginia had a comparatively large free black population. So she sought to uh, escape to Richmond, Virginia to uh, associate with that free black population. And at the end of my book, I discuss a woman named Hannah who was twice 
and lost two children to exposure. She was recaptured and her enslaver, Mary Bowie, petitioned the court in Westmoreland, Virginia to have her sold because of her recidivism. So Hannah's story is one of loss, but also of perseverance and persistence. And each of these stories really are a necessary act of recovery from uh, the trauma in the archive of Black women's experiences. Wow, those are amazing. Those are inspiring stories. And I think what, what strikes me in my book also is, is stories that are inspiring. They're so rich when, when looking at, at the stories of folks who escaped and who persevered. So in, in my book, there are also incredible stories um, throughout this project. And for me, part of what was happening was the anti-slavery movement elevated, um, I mean, really broadcast stories of hope and resistance and escape. They were constantly being talked about and celebrated in the anti-slavery press um, so that individual action could become touch points for collective activism. So there's just so many rich stories um, in my project, but one that I love, which I think comes from chapter six or seven, is about a man named John Roberts who after decades of being enslaved in Baltimore, escapes across the Canada border while traveling with his enslaver in Western New York state in 1837. His enslaver, a man named Richard Stockton, um, knew that he couldn't just recapture Roberts without triggering a diplomatic crisis or perhaps meeting um, armed resistance on the ground in Canada. And this was one of the things that was so significant about the Canada border specifically, was that it was pretty impermeable to slave catching. So instead, this enslaver, Stockton, he basically does this PR stunt where he writes an open letter to John, Rob to John Roberts in the Rochester Daily Democrat, which is a local newspaper in Rochester. The letter is highly performative and frames Roberts as having been a good and loyal slave for 20 years. And he actually invites John Roberts, invites, John Roberts back to slavery, um, saying that there would be no repercussions, no hard feelings. Clearly, he suggested um, John Roberts had been lured away by evil abolitionists um, who had no care for his well being, and that he'd be better off returning to his home and his family, and of course, to slavery. And one of the notable elements of this story is that Stockton dated the letter July 4th. So, what happened next is that John Roberts penned his own letter, which he originally published in the Christian Guardian, which was a newspaper in Toronto where he was now living. And first he points out the ugly irony that Stockton's letter was dated the 4th of July. Roberts asserted that he, Roberts, clearly had a much greater respect and appreciation for freedom than did his enslaver. And why on earth would he voluntarily leave the freedom granted him under the British flag and returned to the United States, the land of slavery. He went on to note that since he had indeed been such a loyal slave, the least Stockton could do would be to forward along Roberts's wife and children to Canada as recompense for his service. So this was an exchange of letters um, that was picked up by the Liberator and from there was widely reprinted in the abolitionist press. And it's just so rich. I love this story um, because it really encapsulates the, the themes that emerged so powerfully throughout my book project. So international borders as places where enslaved people could liberate themselves as um, I would say the theme of the press as a place where ideas about freedom were hashed out and even the 4th of July as a very contested signifier of freedom. So it was stories like this, um, and I just, I really love that one. <laughs> it was stories like this that kept me engaged and excited throughout the research and certainly the writing process. Yeah, those are, those are fantastic stories. And um, there are many more of both of those kinds of stories uh, in, in these books, which is, is one of the reasons, like I said, that um, they make for such powerful reading. So turning now from the more individual personal stories to the wider context that surround these stories, 
Um, can you each say a bit about how that influenced the actors in your book? So, so Karen, how did the realities and the ideologies of the American Revolutionary period influence fugitive enslaved women? Um, and Elena, what, what was happening in the early 1800s that led to the free soil movements that you write about? Yes, thank you uh, for that question. Certainly, um, first and foremost, the American Revolution, as we all know, was based on the premise of freedom for the colonies from control of the British monarchy. And these ideals that were embodied in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal and have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness resonated with enslaved women, as well as men who used the rhetoric of the revolution to claim their right to freedom. And women, of course, heard about these ideals from listening to the conversations of their enslavers, as well as through the slave grapevine that, that carried news from plantation to plantation and even from city to city. So the American Revolution really brought into sharp focus the paradox of slavery and freedom. And African-American women believed in the independence of the individual and they too valued in the most fundamental way what Thomas Jefferson and others would identify as inalienable, inalienable rights. So um, the revolution really affirmed the idea that freedom was a universal birthright and black women seized upon every opportunity of slavery through flight. Of course, um, Lord Dunmore's proclamation issued in 1775 and the Phillipsburg Proclamation issued in 1779 offering freedom to escaped slaves who would aid the loyalist cause led to the escape of thousands of enslaved women as well as men. Also of significance during this period were the leading theoreticians of the revolution, such as James Otis, Isaac Skillman, and Anthony Benazette, who argued that enslaved people had every right to rebel against the system and that there could never be legal title in the ownership of another human being. They correctly saw that the Declaration of Independence was based on a noble idea and a falsehood. And of course, enslaved people recognized this as well. So that the men who comprised the Committee of Five to draft the Declaration were very aware of this contradiction in demanding freedom for themselves while depriving others of their freedom. In fact, Patriots often used the term slave to describe their relationship with Great Britain. And the use of the term slave as a metaphor for the condition of white patriots meant that abolition would not be a part of the revolutionary cause. And of course, slavery continued for nearly 100 years after the American Revolution. So slavery, of course, um, was the foundation of the Southern colonies and later states and slavery was perceived as the basis for white freedom. And there was the belief that property rights was essential to liberty. And what we see during the American Revolution is that enslaved women are pushing against this idea and they sought to claim their liberty during and after the American Re Revolutionary period. And many were successful in doing so. You know, and then, um... In the context of my book, what's happening in the early 1800s is this sort of dark moment where a lot of the promise and potential of the revolutionary period that Karen's book is anchored in um, seems to be diminishing for free and enslaved Black men and women um, ever, ever more. So despite gradual emancipation laws and some steady inroads of anti-slavery sentiment in the North, there's also a rising level of anti-Black racism as free Black populations grew, especially in urban areas in the North, creating labor tension and social tension. There was just this general sense that there were fewer opportunities and increasing hostility toward free Black people and the idea of emancipation. And it was also becoming increasingly clear, um, as if it wasn't already clear enough in the revolutionary period, that white Americans were willing to fight tooth and nail against the idea of black citizenship. So this was born out in places like Ohio, where there were these black laws that had been on the books, but had been um, unused since 1804 and 1807. And then in 1829, Ohio becomes a major flashpoint because the state legislated to resuscitate 
these black laws and declared that they would actually go into effect the following year in 1830. So these laws, um, they included things like forcing black residents to withdraw from military and jury duty. They restricted black people's right to bear arms and they um, forced black residents, free black residents to register with a state and post a costly bond. So to pay money to ensure their good behavior. So basically the black laws seem to confirm many people's fears that African-Americans would never be seen as full citizens in the United States. So it was just, it was a very dark moment. And just after the state announced that the black laws would be going into effect, white residents of Cincinnati, Ohio, actually descended on the city's black neighborhoods in a week long reign of anti-black terror. Um, they burned black businesses, they terrorized black residents, and they ultimately catalyzed um, what sometimes characterized as a mass exodus from the city. So this episode um, is actually what led the first core of black migrants who wound up settling, free black migrants, who wound up settling in Canada to Canada. They were quite literally casting about seeking a new home and they decided to explore whether moving abroad would provide a more secure life as well as the educational and economic opportunities that they expected as free men and women. So basically at the same time that things were looking um, pretty unpromising for free Black Americans and for the cause of emancipation, a number of different ideas were percolating about other places where freedom might be found and um, what it might look like there. So one of the stories that I tell in the book um, is about Prince Saunders, who helped spearhead a major movement of free African Americans to Haiti in the 1820s. And the movement inspired um, really widespread enthusiasm for several years. And it revolved around um, core concepts like citizenship and citizenship rights, uh, land ownership, economic opportunity, and educational opportunity. So these were just some of the circumstances and context um, that brought these conversations about migration and free soil into the mainstream of anti-slavery activism and organizing and thinking. And, um, and it did ultimately catalyze tens of thousands of individuals migrating outward from the United States in search of freedom. Thank you. So, so turning from, from this question to, a, I mean, a, a related topic, but a topic which is embedded in every aspect of, of these stories and, your, and the history that you're telling is, is the, the question of obstacles. Um, obstacles uh, that were faced during the resistance that you both describe um, in your book. So, so specifically, I mean, as I said, this is embedded throughout. So you've, you've touched on this already, but Karen, what obstacles um, were faced by enslaved women who were attempting to escape bondage uh, in, in uh, post-revolutionary America, whether it be through their feet or through the court system? Um, and um, Elena, what obstacles were faced by those seeking freedom and equality by looking abroad to these free soil havens? Yes, thank you. Um, well, certainly during the post-revolutionary period, uh, women faced significant obstacles to freedom uh, coming from really the national government. Article four, section two of the US constitution provided for the capture and return of runaways. And the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 gave enforcement power to this clause by allowing enslavers to capture and return their runaways. President George Washington used this act to pursue his runaway slave on a judge who escaped in 1796 from the Washington's home in Philadelphia, which was then the nation's capital. So Ona successfully escaped to New Hampshire where she lived out the remainder of her life until she died in 1848. And after several attempts to recapture her, the Washingtons eventually gave up their pursuit. In other instances, the post-revolutionary period led to the gradual decline of slavery in the North as Northern states passed gradual manumission laws to end slavery. New York and New Jersey were the last two states in the North to enact gradual manumission laws in 1799 and 1804. 
Now, slavery did not end instantly through these laws, but was maintained for a period as long as 28 years. Another process by which women sought their freedom was through the court. Freeman was the first enslaved woman to successfully sue for her freedom and win. Freeman was enslaved in Sheffield, Massachusetts as a domestic, and she sued for her freedom based on a provision in the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution that declared all men are born free. And in an act radical for the times, she believed that this provision also applied to her. The jury surprisingly ruled in her favor and ordered her enslaver John Ashley to pay 30 shillings in restitution and to cover her court costs. So uh, women faced significant obstacles to freedom, but they persevered throughout this period to secure their freedom, be it through escape or through the courts. Sorry, I have muted myself because there's tree work down the block. Um, so the issue of obstacles in terms of um, international free soil migration is also, it's, it's complex. There's a couple moving parts here. But generally speaking, there were tremendous obstacles facing freedom seekers in international free soil havens. For fugitive slaves, of course, um, the first obstacle was just getting there. Um, the trek across the border with Mexico um, to the southwest, for example, was incredibly perilous. Um, between the environmental dangers like heat and exposure, snakes crossing large rivers, to the fact that um, American slave catchers could actually cross the border with a fairly high level of impunity throughout the early 19th century. So the journey was hard and it was dangerous. Um, and then, you know, getting to the Caribbean required finding a trustworthy boat captain and a lot of luck. And reaching Canada meant navigating through, um, once, once someone even got to the north, navigating through the U.S. north, not always knowing where to go or, very importantly, who they could trust. From the Underground Railroad mythology, you know, we sometimes think of um, this organized network of allies just, you know, waiting to assist people all the way across the border. Uh, but the archive is just full of harrowing stories that include death, recapture, betrayal, I mean, so much betrayal, and incredibly difficult environmental factors, and that's before they even arrived. And then migrants were often disappointed um, by the opportunities um, and obstacles that they found in free soil locations. So Canada is a perfect example of the range of hardships um, that migrants might face. The first organized group of migrants who I mentioned earlier who settled in Canada um, in 1830, they were lucky to make it through the first winter. First, there was the arduous labor of clearing the land. Um, so really you know, clearing some hostile Northern land. Um, the shorter growing season and freezing cold temperatures and heavy snows, they were in really bad shape um, after their first year in Canada. Um, and then even when moving into urban spaces and established communities, migrants consistently noted high levels of racism nearly everywhere they went, from hostility and sneers in the street to, um, to de facto school segregation and other segregated spaces. Um, in one of the more interesting archival tidbits I found, Toronto's Black community sent several petitions to the city to try to ban Blackface performances at the circus because it seemed to be stoking um, the, the racism among the audience. So many migrants actually made no bones about the fact that, um, that life in Canada was such that if it weren't for the legal equality, that they were granted as British subjects, they would return to the United States. That's how virulently racist they found the social environment across the border. But one thing that I actually want to emphasize here is that despite the hardships, um, and there really, there were more than enough, um, reports about life from abroad also contained a lot about how, um, how life differed in very positive respects from freedom in the United States, especially around legal standing and legal equality. And this was ultimately the major message that was returning back from Canada. 
um, that racism was pervasive and pernicious, but that black migrants were able to fight for their rights and equitable treatment because they were considered British subjects and the legal equals of white Canadians. So the consistency of that message was one of the major reasons that Canada became so important in the anti-slavery movement, um, a real touchstone. But it's also just a good reminder that despite the hardships that um, and the racism that Black migrants faced in Canada, um, there was a really core and important difference, which is that legal, equal legal standing and legal equality. Um, and that made the hardships worth it for, um, for many, many people who left. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so one of my favorite things about being a history editor is I love hearing about the research process. Um, so can we spend a little time discussing um, your individual research processes? Um, tell us a little bit about your experience in the archives, the sources you used. And in this case, I'm especially interested in the silences uh, that, that were there and how you how you accounted for those silences. Um, and also if there were any surprises that you encountered. Okay, so I'll start first. Um, well, in terms of process, what I learned from writing this history is that really fugitive women are not missing from the historical record, nor are they really silent in the sources. On the contrary, fugitive women are really everywhere in newspaper advertisements, they're in trial records, and they're in other official records. Um, fugitive women appear as expert witnesses in trial records, for example. So the challenge for me was not locating sources on enslaved women's escape, but making sense of the fragmented evidence. So I began to read my sources for the political and symbolic significance of clothing that fugitive women took with them or wore as they fled. Women such as Margaret Grant, for example, appropriated the tools of the master, including his dress, to dismantle their enslavement. So these sources read in conjunction with and against one another provide multiple perspectives on enslaved women's experiences. And reading multiple sources and developing this understanding of the economic, social, and political significance of women's flight allowed me to appreciate the gendered acts of resistance performed by these women. So in excavating the experiences of Fugitive women, I use what Sherry Katz termed researching around the subjects in order to reconstruct and interpret their lives. Um, this process involved mining the newspaper advertisements of women's flight and then working outward in concentric circles of related sources, such, such as manuscript collections, family papers, and trial records. And integrating these layers of materials enabled me to construct the impact of fugitive women. But of course, it's still a very partial portrait full of silences and um, unanswered questions. So because newspaper ads tended to be incomplete and fragmented, I had to navigate how to work with the list-like quality of the ads and to engage in an imaginative reconstruction deeply rooted in textual scholarship of fugitive women's lived experiences. I've had to read into the silences because that is where we can find women's lives and also embrace the idea that silences can be made to speak for themselves. Um, the case of Margaret Grant in particular reveals that runaway slave advertisements can allow historians to pull back the layers of the printed word to interrogate the experiences of women whose voices have been silent, but whose actions have cried out for interpretation. So I've had to ask myself, what are the experiences and connections that lie behind these records? And I've had to identify other fragmented stories to fill in the void of what we do not know. In other words, I used the fragments of enslaved women's lives to create a full picture of them. And trial records of Juliet and Peggy, for example, who were a part of the Maroon community near Savannah, were insightful in providing the backstory to the Maroons living near Savannah. In this way, I was able to confront inequalities of power in the production of sources, archives, and, and narratives. So I actually was surprised that um, my sources weren't as fragmented as I was anticipating going into, into my research. Um, so my, my book draws on the absolute wealth of sources written and printed as part of the anti-slavery movement. 
Anti-slavery advocates were thinkers, they were writers, they were speakers, and they engaged with ideas about slavery and freedom through robust print exchanges circulated across the United States. So my work relied heavily on newspapers, reports and pamphlets. Uh, people were simply writing a lot about what they were thinking about. And my research was on what they were thinking about and why. So I also, though, drew on um, fiction and poetry and plays to help trace the many ways that information and reflections on free soil permeated anti-slavery um, thinking and action. So one of, one of my favorite sources to use, um, and this was also a surprise, was actually Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, which in my book, I read in terms of how Harriet Beecher Stowe's plot line was fundamentally shaped by her own ideological perspective on where her protagonists should go and why. They wind up in Upper Canada, which is modern day Ontario, um, Quebec, France. They meet up with a relative who was freed in the French Caribbean. And in the end, they wind up sailing for Liberia after first considering and then rejecting the idea of Haiti. So their family odyssey from slavery to freedom was very much a product of the expansion of free soil options um, in, the, in the decades prior to Harriet Beecher Stowe writing this very famous book. And looking at uh, the book from this perspective also highlights, I think, how deeply conservative it ultimately was with Harriet Beecher Stowe actually advocating black relocation to Liberia because she did not really envision a future for them in the United States. And because Uncle Tom's Cabin was one of the single greatest contributions to galvanizing anti-slavery, widespread anti-slavery sentiment in the mid 19th century, I think it's easy to overlook this, but black, criti sorry, black critics at the time certainly called it out. Um, and it's right there in the text. The book is, pro-freedom, um, but the way it engages with international free soil havens to imagine what that freedom could and should look like and where it should be really, to my mind, exposed the limits of many white Americans' imagination. So there are lots of surprises like that in the archives for me, um, but I think the other biggest surprise that I found was abundance. Um, which is not typical of projects that are handling slavery and enslavement. Um, and this was, you know, really because I was looking at a culture within the anti-slavery movement of talking about and thinking about free soil. So there was just a lot more there than I anticipated as escapes and migrations were being highlighted and celebrated in the anti-slavery press and specifically people's letters from different places abroad, both self-emancipated men and women and free African-American migrants, they were writing back from their new homes and their letters were being printed and distributed pretty widely within the anti-slavery movement. Um, so I think sim simply put, anti-slavery advocates were thinking about free soil a lot and it resulted in a really robust archive. And I feel like I could write 12 books mm -hmm. from the archival material that I found, which was um, not what I was anticipating at all. Great, thank you. That, that's fascinating um, in both cases. Um, so we have a question from um, an attendee. Um, and I really like this question because uh, bo because your books are narrative history, you know, at, at its best. It's, the general readers would like to read these books, and they're also going to be really great in the classroom um, for students. So this question is about that. Um, it says, does either author have suggestions for supplemental activities to use when assigning their book to students, such as particular such as particular primary sources that would work well for undergraduates? Well. Um... That's a very good question. Um, I think that Lathan Winley's um, four volume runaway slave advertisements would be an excellent resource to use in your undergraduate classes. Um, Lathan Winley has documented 8,000 runaway slaves and the advertisements that he's um, collected really over a, a decade um, and published in four volumes, each volume representing um, 
different states is a valuable resource that undergraduates um, would gain tremendous insight from learning and looking at these um, these advertisements. Also, there are, of course, digital databases that are available um, at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. There are runaway there's also Freedom on the Move digital database, but um, there's plenty of, of resources out there for undergraduates to gain insights from the experiences of the women and men who um, sought to gain their freedom. And, you know, two other sources that I would add to that excellent set of recommendations is one, um, Benjamin Drew's A North Side View of Slavery. Uh, there's a really fun project that I did, um, largely because I'm visual, so I, I mapped it out, but also because it was, quite frankly, fun. So I recommend it um, easily for classroom use. Benjamin Drew was a white anti-slavery advocate who crossed the border into Canada and um, interviewed self-emancipated, um, largely self-emancipated, but also free African-American migrants in Canada about their life in slavery and their life in freedom. And part of what these interview snippets, um, and you can actually find Harriet Tubman in there. So part of what happens in these interview snippets is folks talk about where they were from and often um, sometimes in, in brief and sometimes at great length, they talk about their odyssey to freedom, where they went and how they got to Canada. So what I did and which I recommend um, as a classroom activity is actually having students map out, visually map out these stories. And you can just see all of the different ways that people were escaping slavery from where to where and the great stories that, um, that they can tell about those experiences. And then the other source that I would recommend is the Colored Conventions. And the, um, the Colored Conventions project is a great, I mean, a truly great resource for reading the, the meeting notes from these organizing, um, these Black organizers in the 19th century who gathered together to discuss the most important um, agenda items for uh, emancipation, for racial uplift, everything that was on, on the agenda for Black organizing was discussed at these meetings that happened across the country and across the 19th century. And those are great sources to use in the classroom to see how, the, how these different dynamics around free soil kind of shook out in real time. Those are fantastic suggestions. Thank you. So we are actually already out of time, I can't believe. But um, it's been wonderful. It's been a real treat for me getting to talk to both of you together like this. And as you know, a real honor to have published both of these books. Um, so thank you both for being here. Thank you all for attending. So thank you all and hope to see you again at another Cambridge History Conversation soon. <laughs>